With rolling mountains surrounded by deep, dark blue waters, the sounds of birds singing while common dolphins can be seen playing in the water, bright blue skies or soft clouds resting gently on mountain slopes, the Marlboro Sound is iconic, peaceful, and full of natural beauty that makes one's soul come alive. The Marlboro Sound is a destination that must be added every Kiwi's bucket list. Whether it's to explore nature and view the ample wildlife through one of the many hikes that are available, go on an adventure cruise or try your hand at some fishing, or visit one of the many quintessential New Zealand communities to learn about the history of the region and taste world-famous wine and green-lipped mussels. The Marlboro Sound has something for everyone and is one of the most amazing places I've had the privilege to explore. To be able to explore the region by sailboat felt like I was stepping back in time. For centuries, millennia even, this region was used as a safe haven from bad weather by the Maori. That was definitely the case for us, but I'll talk more about what a fellow sailor can expect later in this episode. As one Maori legend has it, the sound is the result of a drowned prow of a great waka belonging to Maori gods of an ancient heaven. The journey was so long and so far from their source of power that they ended up getting trapped on earth during a fierce storm that broke their vessel into pieces and caused it to capsize. The broken pieces of the prow are what form the waterways and islands of the Marlboro Sounds. Another Maori legend believes the sound of the tentacles of a giant octopus that the great Maori navigator Kupe killed while in the Cook Strait. In fact, a sound is often formed by the seas flooding a river valley. A close sibling to a sound is a fjord, which is formed when instead a glacier has carved out a valley or when the seas invade a glacier valley. The Marlboro sounds are actual sounds, but the more famous Milford sound is actually a fjord. The Marlboro sounds are the only large area in New Zealand that is sinking, not rising from the seas. And this is because the sounds lie on the western side of the Alpine Fault. So as the sounds move slowly northwards every year, they're also slowly faulting downwards into the sea. We're visiting the Marlboro Sounds on a 2004 Vickers 45 monohull sailboat with Captain Mark and his son Brett. I've only just met the captain a week prior. My name is Danielle and I am a sailboat hitchhiker. My husband and I were sailing full time when suddenly we experienced a massive medical emergency which made him not want to sail anymore. But I still do want to sail. I love sailing. So now I'm jumping on random sailboats every once in a while to discover New Zealand, build my sailing resume, and also to keep this channel going. And I'm really excited because as I've built my resume, I have actually secured my first yacht delivery coming up at the end of this month, which I'm super stoked about. If you're coming from the east like us, the easiest point of entry is through the Tory Channel, which takes you into the most famous Queen Charlotte Sound. Home to the largest port in the Sounds, Picton, this is also the route for the ferries that connect the North and South Islands. Be careful. They are 5,000 tons, travel up to 18 knots, and they cannot get out of the way for sailboats. There's no question, the ferries always have the right of way. So if you're entering, check the ferry times online and monitor VHF channel 16, as all boats, including you, are required to announce your passage through the channel 10 minutes before your arrival. And only one vessel may go through at a time. I didn't know what to expect when we entered the sounds, but being home to almost one fifth of New Zealand's coastline, I definitely thought there'd be tons of sandy beaches. But actually, the nature of how a sound is created means the water stays deep up until the shoreline in most places. And where there are beaches, most of them are pebbles or rock. So the sounds really aren't the place to go if you imagine laying out in the sun. Rather, it's known for its hiking, fishing, and water sports. This also means that for those coming in by boat, you'll be anchoring in 10 plus meters of water, which makes it hard to tuck in close to land to get protection from big winds. For this reason, it's common in the Marble Sounds to use a stern line or pick up one of the many mooring balls we saw. Most moorings are owned by the local boat clubs, but several are also owned by the local resorts. And that's how we found ourselves headed towards the Portage, where I started to learn a fascinating history of the region. So apparently the Marble Sounds wasn't hugely settled by the Maori, not compared to populations that were on the North Island, 
but they did come in here to avoid bad weather and also used a lot of the resources that were in the area. Um, it's interesting because apparently you can follow these portage paths where they used to carry their canoes over land to um, get to each sound because for example like you can go all the way around the sound and it'll be 80 nautical miles but you cross on land and it's only one nautical mile. Um, so yeah, they used to just walk with their canoes. European history of the area is considered to start with Captain Cook, who was a captain in the British Royal Navy, a navigator, and a cartographer who proclaimed British sovereignty over the South Island at Motuara Island in 1770. He's also famous for creating the first semi-accurate map of New Zealand. But I was surprised to hear this fun fact about his history in the Marlborough Sounds. While he was here, he discovered a piece of grass called cooked scurvy grass that was high in vitamin C and he required his crew to eat it in order to prevent scurvy. <laughs> Sailing through the Marlborough Sounds, it became evident that most of the area is sparsely populated and in some areas only accessible by boat. The region is so remote, in fact, that locals in the Polaris Sound still rely on the over 100-year-old Polaris Express mailboat to deliver their mail, groceries, and even farming supplies. Based at Havelock Marina, the boat is the best way to discover Polaris Sound if you only have a day. You know, it's funny, in sailing we like to think that we're the most free because we can go anywhere with our traveling little floating home, but that looks a lot like freedom to me too, you know? Just in the middle of nowhere, no one around you, peace and quiet. You can probably have a boat out front and just hop on it to go visit different places. That looks nice too. I think I like that also. While the apparent freedom of the local lifestyle was certainly appealing, the region holds a history of a very labor-intensive economy. A century ago, the Marlboro Sounds were busy with whalers, miners, sawmillers, shipbuilders, and farmers. Nowadays, though, the primary industries are forestry, pastoral farming, aquaculture, and viticulture. In fact, the Marlboro Sounds dominate the entire New Zealand market for green shell mussels, farm salmon, and wine. The most famous wine in this region, and actually for New Zealand overall, is Sauvignon Blanc. I personally recommend Dashwood brand, which is fruity, slightly citrusy, and has a bit of a pear taste. Now at this point, you might be like me and already plotting ways to abscond with your husband from his new job and move to the Marlboro Sounds. Well, another day in paradise. It's been a fantastic, lovely day. But first, let me just tell you about the weather. While the Marble region overall boasts being one of the sunniest regions in New Zealand, the nature of the sounds, well, make it temperamental. Just looking at the sounds, one would have the illusion that the area is hugely protected and you could safely anchor in numerous bays. Actually though, the winds often accelerate down hills, through valleys, and around various obstacles, leaving you with wind from multiple directions that can change on the dime and don't align with the forecast. It's always a bit of a shame when you're at a beautiful location and you have to move because the wind's shifting. You don't want to be facing the wrong direction on this wind. We often found ourselves barely moving along in eight knot winds. And then suddenly, for no apparent reason, we were faced with 40 knot winds in the opposite direction that left us overpowered. So when anchoring, all typical logic goes out the window. What would seem like a beautiful sandy beach with great holding actually left space for wind to funnel through, causing 180 degree spins throughout the night. Your best bet is a cove surrounded by hills, all of the same height, and a stern line if you want a little extra safety. While anchored, it's not surprising to see some of the ample wildlife in the area. We were lucky enough to see dolphins, seals, shags, and in one particular anchorage in Polaris Sound, heaps of moon jellyfish. Moon jellyfish are almost entirely translucent, between 10 to 16 inches diameter, and they have four pink horse-shaped reproductive organs that are easy to spot. Now, if one so desires, you can actually swim with these jellyfish, as the upper surface is safe and even the tentacles only have a light sting which is harmless to humans. I don't see us swimming in this water. Will you be swimming, Captain Mark? I don't think so, right? 
However, in the warm summer months, moon jellyfish can sometimes bloom in large swarms as we saw, in which case they actually kill farmed salmon en masse with their stinging cells. Now, while nature never ceases to fascinate me, I was particularly keen to see one of the towns in the region. You see, New Zealand is a country of paradoxes for me. While on one hand, many will hold up New Zealand as being a country leading progress, using examples such as being the first country to grant women the right to vote in 1983, allowing same-sex marriages in 2013. The vote makes New Zealand the first country in Asia Pacific to legalize same-sex marriage and the 13th in the world. In legalizing euthanasia in 2021, New Zealand is like any other country where small rural communities tend to hold more conservative values. I remember driving down a rural road one day back in 2019 and seeing a billboard against a new law that was take abortion off the 1961 Crimes Act. I had just assumed abortion was legal in New Zealand. And not to take this episode to a dark place, but New Zealand has some of the worst statistics in the world for mental health and domestic abuse. So with these paradoxes in mind, I was curious. What would a small town in Marlboro Sounds be like? Would they even serve me beer? I always find it so nerve-wracking coming into these new places that have lots of markers and tons of open space that looks safe but really isn't because, you know, it's not deep enough. So we're having to keep an eye out for all the markers and, yeah, more adventure. Just a quick note about navigating your way to the marina. Due to the strong currents that flow through the Havelock Channel, it's recommended to enter the channel at slack tide. And if your draft is more than one meter, you should only enter the channel at the top half of the tide. The most confusing part is between markers 11 and 13, where you need to make sure you hug the red markers around the curve of the land to be in the deepest waters. It's definitely one of the more confusing channels I've ever navigated, and having an updated Navionics map helped heaps. So I always think it's funny that as sailors we're so obsessed with freedom and being able to go wherever we want, but when we get to the dock we kind of get a new sort of freedom and that's the freedom to come and go as we please, <laughs> right? Because when you're on a boat with like a couple people and you've only got one dinghy, you can't just, you know, take off with the dinghy. You have to make sure you coordinate with everyone. So being able to leave at your own will, it's pretty freaking free, <laughs> right? I was excited to explore Havelock, as I'd heard that after gold had been discovered nearby in 1864, Havelock became a service center for the miners, with stores, wholesale merchants, and inns quickly popping up. However, the gold rush didn't last longer than a year or so, so the town transitioned to being a stopover for travelers, with a small salma industry also popping up. The town is located on an important historic paw site, which is a Maori term for a defense post put up around a Maori territory to protect fertile land and food supplies. You can visit the Havelock Museum if you want to learn more about the town's history. With only a population around 600 people, Havelock's actually done a great job of making itself famous for something I find particularly delicious. All right, so one of the funny things about being in a small town is uh, just funny decorations like this up here. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to try some green mussels at some point. Unfortunately, I was only in Havelock a few days before heading home, and most of the restaurants were closed due to Waitangi Day holidays. That is something you have to be aware of, by the way. While seemingly December through February would be the best months to visit the area, a lot of New Zealand closes down over the several holidays that run over that time frame. Also, anchorages are freaking crowded over those months. So instead of grabbing some famous mussels, I headed to the local Foursquare, which was the only market in town, and I grabbed the closest thing to craft beer that I could find. Well, I'm pretty sure a bunch of crafty companies are gonna hate me for this, but it's the truth. My go-to beer throughout the sailing trip has been BRB Hazy, and pretty much the only reason why is because there's not a lot of access to craft beer along this trip. Like here in Havelock at the Foursquare, there's only three craft beers and they're all castles. And I personally find castles a bit too malty. So 
This has been pretty much everywhere I go. It's a good beer, it's good for the price. It's not, you know, amazing. This is definitely not nothing compared to Behemoth Hazy, but it's pretty good, <laughs> better than Heineken. <laughs>